just going to move on and introduce our speaker today. So today we have Brad Ivan. Uh, thank you for coming. He is the executive director of the MS and product management program at CMU. Before directing the program, he taught HCI for product managers and was an adjunct advisor for the program's capstone projects. Brad has more than two decades of experience in manufacturing and product launch readiness, having held a variety of roles in a diverse set of corporate cultures. As a young engineer, Brad earned new product launch experience during his time with Toyota Motor Manufacturing with the data-driven problem-solving foundation developed at Toyota. He then moved to manage a cross-functional engineering team and portfolio of projects, Pittsburgh-based MSA. After MSA, Brad moved to project and operations roles at smaller companies in the electrical and semiconductor industries. In each of these roles, Brad focused on building team-oriented cultures and initiated new product development and launch processes. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Pittsburgh. So I'll let you get started. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today, and thanks for those online for dialing in. Uh, as, as kind of a kickoff to today's discussion, first, let me say that those pitches were, I think, excellent context and excellent. We'll see a lot of uh, direct correlation between the design process we'll discuss today and where you guys stand right now. And as it relates to that, I wanted to give everybody, you've seen this uh, slide in the background, but I wanted to give everybody just one more minute to kind of pull out a pencil paper or use a tablet and sketch a superhero engineer. And we'll get into why this may become relevant. And uh, after, after a minute or two, we will, <laughs> we will, we will share some of those attributes that, or even if you want to share the image, uh, feel free. I'll give you about two minutes and just think about what a super engineer might look like to you. And we'll get into how that relates to the attributes that tie directly into the design process that we're about to discuss. And at the end, if anybody's brave enough to share, uh, Allison, you'll be able to sh sh show there. Okay, yeah. And as we kind of settle in, any, anybody that has questions, please interrupt me in, in mid-discussion. I want this to be more interactive than lecture in, in every way. I think everybody gains from that. And uh, just like the pitches that we heard uh, before the session, the more that we can relate it to real world and, and the problems that you are encountering and the challenges that you're facing, the better we'll be. We'll go 30 more seconds. Great. Okay, so you've just uh, designed your first, uh, you've gone through your first design activity of the day today. And we'll get back to sketching and where that fits into the process later. But before we do, anybody uh, wanna share your drawing or um, share some attributes as to what this engineer looked like? Anybody in the room? Giant brain, you know, can fly maybe, I don't. Okay, we have, a, we have an actual sketch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, a cyborg. Uh, so, uh, that that might be the, the 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 answer of the future, and with the intelligent future being our our motto here, maybe that's correct. Any others before we kind of move on and move beyond the the activity itself? Okay, one more. Uh, 
Okay, that's that's a good lead in. The way that this would be identified, the way that super engineers are identified at Toyota is by dirty hands. It's kind of a cultural expectation at Toyota Motor Manufacturing. And there are several reasons for this. And it's actually considered an insult to be considered a desk engineer, if you can imagine that. Can anybody guess as to why dirty hands indicate a good engineer and distinct, distinguish them from the rest. In the field, exactly. And that's, that, that's, that's huge for what we're gonna discuss. See, yeah, depth of problem solving, correct. Anything else? There, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons that are all related to each other. Anybody else have? Um, Hands-on, not a theoretician. Hands-on, not a theoretician, yes. Um, oh, yes, and we'll, we'll, cover, we'll cover, we'll bridge that today during the discussion. The, and for those, it was the gap between design and making it happen was the answer inside the room. I forgot I need to relay the answers inside the room for the audience online. Yeah. Working, it, uh, working in the team. Working in the team instead of kind of individual solitary work. work. Yes. Working with the team and, and the ability to interact with people at the source of the problem. And uh, I'll just add one more is you're using all your senses when you're in the context of the problem. So the idea is, if there's a problem next door, I should be next door if I'm trying to solve it. Um, and it's, it's so deep into their culture. These are other images from their website right now, indicating their engineering staff and their R&D staff. You can see their action photos. They're not, they're not theoretical. They're not, they're not I, I'm making an assumption and I think this might be the problem. It's really getting in there, getting dirty. And that's the way that, that's the, one of the secrets to Toyota's success. So how does that relate to the topic of the discussion? How does that have anything to do with customers and how, to, how does that have anything to do with design thinking? So the way that we're going to approach design today is not that design is creating a widget or an app or something that is a product or service by itself in isolation. The way instead that we're gonna look at it is we're gonna be looking to solve our customers' problems. And that changes the direction of the mindset toward solving these problems. You may think you have a great idea, but you may not understand what the user or the customer is really experiencing in the process. And we wanna make sure that we give proper emphasis to those aspects of problem solving that are hands-on, that are customer focused and focus on the problem first. Probably everybody, myself included, uh, everybody probably on the planet at this point has tried to solve a problem in, of one manner or another where you jump straight to a solution. And then you realize it, it happens all the time, way too often that you realize that you didn't understand the problem in the first place. And all it took was, all I need to do is go ask this person what's, what's causing them frustration. And that would have been enough to save you all the effort of trying and failing. If you took that, if you put the step of discovery in front of your solution, it gives you the opportunity to start on a much better foundation. The principles and the process that we're gonna talk about today, they apply pretty much to any kind of product or service. They're pretty universal. This is ultimately kind of a crash course of a crash course. We're gonna go through the process at lightning speed. We'll cover some of the high points. It gets much deeper, of course, but for the sake of today's discussion, this is an intro in how to approach the project, knowing what some of the techniques and some of the methodologies are that you should be using in the process. So whether it's software, whether it's hardware, or whether it's service, we'll cover the, the, the ideas will be 
applicable with minor adaptation to all of the above. So today, the purpose of this discussion is to learn a design framework in fundamental principles with emphasis on getting dirty so that we may deliver value to the customers by solving their problems. And I brought an example from my daily life that kind of misses the mark on this. And the process we'll discuss will help, would have helped in the design of this, at least I think, for me anyway, and um, would have saved a lot of cost, a lot of effort, a lot of um, all of the above. It would have avoided solving the wrong problem or a problem that doesn't exist and also avoiding solving it the wrong way. And the example I'll use, I'll cover the brand name just so that nobody's embarrassed. It's an electric toothbrush. And you can't see in the room, but this happens to be a Bluetooth toothbrush. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the right answer. <laughs> that's the right answer. So I have a Bluetooth toothbrush. Um, why did I have a Bluetooth? Why do I have a Bluetooth toothbrush? In, in some sense, I don't know because I never have used the Bluetooth. I've never been curious as to what it does. It doesn't seem to solve any problem in my life. So I have no interest in that feature. It's there. It was on sale. It was a great deal. It was really cheap. Um, so if you want to sell products that have a lot of expensive features at a loss, then add features that nobody cares about and don't actually solve anybody's problems. I couldn't even imagine carrying my phone and the toothbrush together at the same time. Like uh, it's, it's, it's bizarre. So they solved a problem, at least in my opinion, or with me as the user, they solved a problem that doesn't exist. Not only that, but in providing the interface, there is a, a series of LED indicators for battery charge life. And that, when it's on at night, looks like a UFO is landing in my bathroom. It's so bright, it, it literally illuminates the entire bathroom and the bedroom next door to it. So it's just like the wrong solution to a problem that is not correct. On the plus side, it does a great job as a mechanical toothbrush. So it, it does what I need, but it has these, they invested money and time into these features that I can't imagine anybody using. And judging by the room, nobody else can imagine it either. But, so we'll talk about how not to do that. <laughs> I don't, maybe it does, maybe it does. Maybe I'm really underutilizing it and it, it's, but, uh, but um, so, uh, Today, um, in with within the agenda, we'll talk. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my experience and how it relates to this talk. We'll talk about you, and we kind of already did. So, if there's, we'll, we'll get to um, how we might set up the remainder of the discussion to apply to your context, if at all possible. We'll talk about the methodology, the framework that we're going to discuss is called double diamond, and the four. Uh, the four basic uh, sections in the double diamond process are discover, define, then we'll have another activity, a short, a brief one, and then design and deliver, and then question and answer afterward. And I, I can stick around after, after the presentation's over if anybody in the room or even online wants to, uh, wants to chat. And we'll have a third activity if time permits, but it's somewhat unlikely. So as we go forward today, let's interact, raise your hand, you know, chime in if you have ideas. The, the more that we can relate these things to maybe your own, your own product, your own, your own idea, invention, whatever it may be, the, the more productive it will be. And I mentioned this is a broad overview. We won't go into too much depth on much, many of the principles or the tactics, except perhaps for the, the dirty hands portions, which is interviewing your customers, interviewing your users, understanding how they accomplish the goals that you're trying to improve for them. So um, in pretty much everything that we discussed today is gonna be, I, I, I 
the the tone of the discussion the more that it's practical and le more practical less academic the better it i think it relates and applies to everybody's everybody's own situation so about me um i my foundation is at toyota it's everything that i've learned in terms of problem solving for those who may already be aware the toyota way toyota has a a very culturally ingrained way of looking at problems identifying problems, collaborating, solving problems. That's, that's kind of my starting point. That's the angle that I'm coming at this from. I started at Toyota and took those principles progressively to smaller and smaller companies, and in some cases family owned, in some cases tech companies that are sort of semiconductors and things like that. Um, so I, I've seen them applied in different uh, cultural aspects. And I've seen them in different industries, different ways of looking at um, product uh, development. For the last two years, uh, I was teaching across the street at the HCI, uh, teaching HCI for product managers, which is human computer interaction, which is basically a, a, an intro course into all of these design principles as it relates to mostly interfaces and, and digital products. And these things together, the, the combination of the Toyota way and design thinking, uh, lean thinking is in Toyota way I'm using interchangeably. They, as you dig into them, as you understand them, they're remarkably similar and parallel. To me, they're kind of the same way of looking at a problem. It's hands-on human centered, all these things that, uh, are obvious when you take a step back to think about it, but not obvious to everybody as they're in the mix, as they're actively trying to solve problems. It's very tempting for, uh, for an engineer, a designer, a, an entrepreneur to, um, very tempting to think that you know the answer already. So I'll just skip all these other steps. And we'll talk about how that results in things like Bluetooth toothbrushes. But, um, and then right now, I'm the executive director of the MS and product management program, two floors up, and uh, have been for about the past year. And just a quick note about that program. We're one of a kind. There aren't other programs that are MS and product management. We're a hybrid between Tepper and the School of Computer Science. And we are a blend of technical business design and leadership all within a one-year program. It's, it's, uh, it's unique in that sense and it's different than anything else that exists. And it is, a, as everything that I discuss in terms of designing a product today applies to this program. It's only four years old. We're still designing, figuring out who our customers are, what problems we exist to solve, all these things. And we're iterating upon that. So. It's uh, everything that we talk about will be directly applicable and I'll show you how. how oh, um, it's so most our product management program as, as, we, as we view it is, it started with a tech product focus. And as the, th this is kind of what I mean when I say that we're discovering, we're discovering what the market uh, demands and what problems we can solve for prospective students. It started almost 100% computer science undergrads. And then we opened it up and we prototyped and we experimented with some, okay, an electrical engineer, mechanical engineer. Uh, let's see how they, what their outcomes look like and what their experience is like. And so we've done that across a range of experiences, uh, undergrad backgrounds. We have students that already have MBAs and we get to observe how they fare, how their outcomes look in the program. So uh, that's, that's why I sort of broke down what our students look like. So about, about, the, about the audience here, um, is there anybody that as it relates to what we've already covered design-wise, anybody that has an active problem 
that you know already you're facing in this in this area or getting ready to getting ready to interact with customers potential customers customers of competitive products anything like that anything that could be relevant as we continue to have this discussion Sure. So, um, in my understanding, maybe I'll just like kind of why there's why a lot of shops do use a product that is just a second picture. So, I'm looking at all the characteristics and then just identify a major problem. Probably because the target is so small. So, it's not necessarily the case to my Yeah. And just, just out of curiosity, have you been on site to observe users attempting the process as it exists now? Okay. 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 Um, and for those for those online who might not have been able to hear, it was the 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 problem was related to the. The human factor difficulties and customer expectations related to EV batteries is that a battery charging, battery charging. yes um, and, and that's that's good I, I think I think that serves as an example that we can materialize or, or envision throughout the rest of the discussion is there anybody just out of curiosity who has experience with the design thinking process okay Okay, in this discussion, I think we may um, will be shallow enough into the details that it will be a relatively beginner level or introductory level and things that you things that I hope are practical enough that you can, as we go through the discussion, you can at least consider, hey, this I can do this right now as it relates to the project I'm working on. So great. The double diamond process. This is the foundation of the course that I taught HCI for product managers. And um, this, is, this is a quote that I think applies quite directly to the process itself. If I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about the solutions. That's Einstein. Um, that's that's <laughs> just to give a, um, I'll, 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 I'll show you how that played itself out in even creating the script for this discussion. But this process, and it's, it's all, it's, if you look up Google images, you can see different images. It's, there are different variations. Everyone creates their own twist. But this is a simple version where on the left side, we are talking about the, this diamond is the problem space diamond. And then the right side is the solution space diamond. And you go progressively from left to right in the process. You start with a hypothesis or an observation or a belief that you might know what the problem is on the far left. And then you discover this is where you assume that you don't really know anything. And you do all the research, all the data collection, all the contextual inquiry that you can till you have a solid understanding of what the problem really is. And then you converge those ideas, you make sense of them, you synthesize them, and that's the left-hand diamond. Then, and after you really know the problem, after you can articulate it properly, then you start designing. And then you start designing with an open mind, divergent thinking again. And you don't want to rule out bad ideas because there might be some nugget in there that turns into a good idea. And then on the far right, you start testing and refining and 
making that design, making the design that you have selected to move forward with, or designs plural, um, a real thing, and then ship. So this is what we'll cover today. And like I mentioned, uh, there's a problem space, solution space, and then throughout what I did not mention is you iterate. Uh, you, you may find that each step needs multiple iterations, or you might have simultaneous steps ongoing. For hardware products, the, um, the concept is the same, but you might have a different, it, it's not as sequential, it's not as agile, it's, it's more, um, there are more lead times involved. Like if you're, if you're designing a toothbrush, you need the injection molding, you need the tooling, you need, you need the physical, and physical prototypes just take longer than digital prototypes. So all of these are, they're different ways of looking at the same set of concepts. The discover stage. And I think if, if there's one quote that I hope that the audience takes and remembers, it's the simplest one. It's just go see, ask why, and show respect. And this is Fujio Cho, ex-president of Toyota. Um, but it's so simple and so often done incorrectly or not at all that it's, it's, it leads to more problems than, than it solves. So we'll talk about Discover at this point. And I mentioned that the Discover portion is so fundamental in setting the right trajectory, moving in the correct direction. This is the affinity slash storyboard that I created just for this discussion. The circled, the circled portion is the number of notes that I had related to discovery compared with everything else. That's how important I think it is that we get discovery right. And if it's the only thing that we cover today, then it's still well worth it. Um, discover, your goals are to collect data, to empathize, to understand the lives of your customers, your users, and to observe. The mindset should be humble. Don't make the mistake of thinking you know the answer. Inquisitive, hands-on as much as possible. The tactics that will, there are many tactics, but some of the high points that we'll discuss today are interviews and surveys, journey mapping, competitive analysis, and stakeholder mapping. So between interviews and surveys, who has a thought as to when you might use a survey versus going to interview customers? Number of people, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and part of that is because interviews are much more time consuming and interviews are more expensive as a result. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, one gives you statistics and one gives you insights. Yeah. Um, that's, that, that's, that pretty much covers, covers it in a nutshell. The, the main reason that the focus of this discussion is interviews and as much as possible interviews in the context of your customer. Interviews for, if we're looking at, at, uh, at, at painting, where are they doing that? And how, what, is, what does their process look like? And can I try it with my own hands? That type of thing. Um, the more that we can get into the context of the customers, the more you'll understand the different types of customers and the more you'll understand the real pain points that are opportunities for solution. So um, as we talk about the interviews, which is the one area where we'll go somewhat relatively deep, um, we're gonna talk about the preparation for the interviews are anticipate goals. And those are both your goals and your customer's goals. What are they trying to accomplish? And what do you want to verify in the process of the interview? How, how, how far along are you in understanding where they exist? And do you understand the types of users, their context, their process, or is it um, something that you're just starting to learn? Um, script your, the other thing to consider, point two here, is script your interview, plan it properly, and be ready to record it. Because you'll want to, as you learn more, you'll want to come back to see what that first interviewee said. 
because I think you, you won't pick up the same details necessarily as you move forward in the discovery process. And then if your product does not already exist, then conduct interviews on the competition or the way it's done right now to see what the adjacent opportunities exist and where your competitors are weak. We'll also talk, I'll go through a few slides on types of interviewees, mood and emotion, Genshi Genbutsu, which is basically Toyota, the, the Japanese phrase for go and see. The five wise technique and journey mapping, which are all kind of tangled within the opportunity uh, to perform high quality interviews. One, one item about knowing your users is that they're not necessarily like you and they're not necessarily like each other. We, we use this um, in class, in the full class. We use this example as, uh, as it relates to uh, auto, re, applicant tracking systems and uh, imagining that you are a facility maintenance person who may not be, uh, who may not be a power uh, a, a power PC user, but still has to go through the the res the, the same application process that a computer scientist PhD needs to do, and it's not necessarily as user friendly, and it's not designed really for either of those people. Uh, and this is just just to give you a snapshot in, in terms of computer literacy competence and how it varies, and how it varies geographically, and how it varies across the population. You have a lot of different users. Your product may be for one specific type, or you may be trying to design for everybody, which is quite a bit, they're very different challenges, of course. As you're interviewing people, observe their mood. When, when you have a customer who's frustrated, that's a huge opportunity to dig into why. Understand what, what in this step are you frustrated with? Because that's, a, that's an indication that they expected something to happen and it did not. And you can really look at the process and break it down and understand, understand where you can solve that problem. And the other, the other aspect of this is, um, and it's, it's actually ties into this example. The other aspect of this is you may be with a customer, you may be with some other type of stakeholder for your product and you go to interview them and they're just, this, this happened to me on this project, which I'll discuss. They're just downtrodden. I went to talk to uh, a, a coworker actually about a problem related to our, our shipping docks at one point. And I went to ask him, so can you show me your process? And he, his, he literally, his shoulders slumped. And he, he said, it doesn't matter. I, nobody's gonna listen anyway. Why should I, why should I bother? Why should I bother? waste my time answering questions about this. So that was really an opportunity to not just um, not just ask him about this uh, transactional problem, but also about the support he was getting and all these different these different factors that led him to believe that there is no solution or nobody cares. So this again, emotions, your takeaways from interviews are more than just, concrete observations. They're the way people act. They're the, the body language, the tone, the, um, the level of engagement. And if you can diffuse them and prove to them, you can, you can almost always diffuse them and prove to them that you're here. Your whole goal is to help solve their problem. And then, then they turn around and now you, now you have their engagement. Um, here's another one. This, this is, uh, what, this is an example I have of go and see. So was so was the past one. That's how I found out about about that problem and met that person. This is one we were we were uh, working on delivery for uh, customized products for customers, and the idea was we want to turn these around in a week. And I, I think the standard was two or three weeks at the time. And the, the mission was, it was a pretty complicated process. This is a printing, this is a logo printing machine that you're looking at. And th there was, a, there was an, uh, an art creation process, an approval process, a manufacturing process, all these different processes that led to that three week lead time. And we wanted to crunch it down to one. 
So we, we literally walked the process and we found things like this. And uh, hopefully this is clear enough picture that everybody can see. These are the controls that were on our printing machine and they were so poorly maintained. They were so imprecise that the factory workers actually had to take masking tape and tape the dials down. And we found that that was that alignment problem and that, that mechanical problem actually led to direct customer uh, delays. So as you go and see, there are things in the environment that you would never imagine to be problems just sitting in your desk. Uh, the five whys, we talked about this briefly, but this, this set of five whys uh, relates to the, the barcode scanner that I showed earlier. And it's just five whys is a, a methodology. It's, it's a way of looking at a problem by looking at what you see as the symptom of the problem, asking why it's there, and then not accepting that to be the root of the problem. There may be, there are factors that lead to that, that, that level of problem. And the, 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 the theory, the philosophy is that if you ask five why, ask why five times, you can get to the root. Um, so this is something to consider in your interviews. And one, one note to this is sometimes asking an interviewee or a customer the question why, it might, it might sound accusatory. So you might need to dance around with some softer language or ask about the process rather than them so that they'll give you, give you psychologically safe responses. But this is, you wanna combine these things to get to what the root of their problem is because if you're solving a symptom, the problem still exists when you're done. Um, this is journey mapping, and this is, this is just basically a technique of across the top, we have the steps that a customer goes through, and then we literally chart their emotions step by step and, and make notes as to which of, these, which of these areas in their process give them joy, cause them pain, and that it also is a way to identify opportunities to solve their problems. And then stakeholder mapping. Um, just as, a, as an example, this is my stakeholder map for the MSPM program. And it, it, it's, it's actually more simple than it really is, which means I have, as a program director, I have customers that are students, prospective students, I have customers that are CMU central uh, administration. I have customers in Tepper. I have customers in SCS. I have industrial partners who are also customers to me. So the more that I can understand what they're after, what they need, uh, and this, like for me, displaying it visually like this is a night and day difference versus just trying to think, but Am I keeping the people at SCS happy uh, or do they need something from me? Or are our, students, uh, are our students part of the SCS environment sufficiently? Those types of things. So the other aspect where this is huge is your user might not be the same person as the person with decision-making and buying power. So this is, this is again true in like for uh, resume tracking systems, the user is the applicant, but the person who makes the decision to buy is some HR administrator. And there's a huge, there can be a huge disconnect and you have to keep both of them happy in one way or another. And as far as pitfalls, um, just be careful not to lead your interviewees, not to influence their answers, not to hope that their answers align with yours. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's often, it, it's, it's extremely easy. You want to ask open-ended questions, not yes, no type questions, that type of thing. So this, the interview process is the one thing I wanted to make sure we cover in depth. I'm going to go through other slides pretty quickly um, and maybe stop for, a, for an item or two, but any questions on, on the discovery portion, because it's really, I think it's the one that for this audience is the most relevant, the most impactful, and also simple.
I mean, there's nothing that we talked about just now that's rocket science. It's just, it's having that, that framework laid out, having that strategy and knowing that your data is sound. That, we'll, we'll get to A-B testing when we get to, oh, okay, the, we'll, we'll get the question, well, I guess they see the question, right? Um, the A-B testing is typically during the prototyping stage more so than the discovery stage. We're, we're, we haven't gotten to that point yet. And what was the other? Uh, do you have any thoughts on surveys or surveys? Uh, maybe, maybe this, we talked about this in the room a little bit. But surveys are good if you need a broad, just general understanding and your, your understanding isn't very deep to begin with. Interviews will give you a much deeper, uh, much more vivid description of the problem and problems. Interviews are also more expensive. And it, for, the sake of, for the sake of directing the, this MSPM program, we have just recently used surveys to set up our interviews to give us sort of a direction as to what questions we want to dig into more. The defined stage. So this is the manager who comes up with the right solution to the wrong problem is more dangerous than the manager who comes up with the wrong solution to the right problem. Again, all about making sure you understand the problem that you're trying to solve for your customers. And this is where we bring that data that we collected during Discover and we filter it, we refine it, we make sense of it, we organize it. Um, the goals are to interpret, synthesize, prioritize. The mindset should be analytical and collaborative. This, this can often be a, a process that your entire team is involved with. And I didn't mention that during the discovery, but that should too. The more that you have your designers, your engineers, your salespeople, whatever it might be, involved in understanding firsthand context, the, the deeper the entire team's understanding becomes. Some of the tactics during this step are affinity diagramming, decision matrices, personas. Um, this is actual, these are actual insights that I took from MSPM students fairly recently. Uh, I didn't get to F yet as of when I took this photo, but you can, you can imagine, I, these, were five, these are the results of five interviews. Uh, what I don't have an image of, but I would have, I, I would take those and compile them, organize them into, well, what is important to our students or what, what is, what are their, what are the features of the program that are most valuable? What are the pain points? Organize them according to affinity diagram processes so that we can make sense of and see trends and see, see, uh, see where the, where the data organizes easily. Um, personas, this goes back to the idea that not all your users are necessarily the same. This, a persona is an imaginary profile of a user, of a customer. So this is for the VA system. They, 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 have, they, they took their interview data and compiled it into, there's a type of person that they've identified as the lifer. And they have attributes to this person. They, they give this person a name and a face so that you can rate, relate to him in this case. And then for the VA system, uh, they have different types of personas and they need to adapt or offer services differently to the different personas. And that's, that's just, uh, it, it's an activity that helps you, helps, helps you bring your mind into the world of all this data that you just collected and to organize it and divide it and understand what's most important too. Uh, decision matrices. So one thing that you can, one way that you can prioritize or start to organize your information is by breaking it down according to the value to, let's say you were designing for this persona, these now we can prioritize according to what's important to them and uh, start to sort the data so that as we enter the design stage, we're designing based on the highest of priorities. 
So um, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to the activity if we have time. Uh, we're running somewhat late, but um, as we, I like this quote, as we enter the, the design portion, every child is an artist. The problem is to remain an artist once they grow up. And I, I actually dedicate this section to my youngest daughter, who is the most creative divergent thinker I've ever met. And uh, this is her tree house that's made with twine and twigs and her mailbox that's a, actually a shoebox. But um, the, the point being is she didn't see limitations. She saw a shoebox and okay, that's good enough. That, that'll, that'll do for, for my, uh, my imaginary world here. So the design stage, often this is called the develop stage. I think that carries software specific connotations. So I'm calling it design. Um, the, a good way to think about this process, the best way to have a good idea is to have lots of ideas. Again, we're opening our mind. We're exploring all the possibilities at this stage. The goals are to ideate, experiment, and prototype. And this is, this is where we, well, we, we haven't gotten into the, actually this is where the A-B testing and, and things like that will start to apply as well. The mindset should be exploratory, egoless. And I have egoless there because in a room full, in a room this size, you may have an idea that makes a little bit of sense. You aren't sure about it. And you don't wanna be ridiculed for having the stupid idea. So you'll just keep it inside. But what we wanna do in this stage is look at every concept. Even when you look at the way that automotive companies deal with concept vehicles, they'll put crazy features on them just to see what that looks like in real life. And it, the experimentation process exists for that reason to be unconstrained and a, a bad idea is better than no idea. A again, um, especially related to prototyping, this is hands-on too. Uh, tactics of prototyping, sketching, and how might we. And prototyping is, uh, it applies in physical products. It applies in digital products, hardware, software. It also applies for services if you are trying to arrange something like DoorDash, you would prototype with uh, different processes and different ways to, to uh, start with small scale, well-selected customers and observe different, different attributes of the transaction so that you learn from it. And what I'm showing is the sort of the evolution from low fidelity prototype to the real product for a, uh, a Toyota Tundra and uh, the far left is a clay model, which is designed for the aesthetic por portions, but more than just the aesthetic, it's designed for feeling the dimensional uh, characteristics. And also you can see the, the lines across the, across the clay body, they're actually tape. And those tape lines help to understand, can this shape be manufactured? Different, different ways to look at Catching, catching feasibility and functionality in an early stage at a low investment quickly. And then that leads to a functional prototype on the road here and then the final product. And it's the same for digital. Uh, you can do paper prototyping to see what an interface would look like and actually have a user test with it. Uh, you can, Nowadays, it's easy enough to have functional click-through prototypes through products like Figma that, um, that you can provide an interface to somebody, say, here's my, here's my mock or my prototype Apple Watch interface. I'd like for you to you know, check, check your calories burned during your workout and have them click through to see if it's usable, if it's easy to use. Here's, here's an example where a chopstick and a, a block of wood were used to prototype the Palm Pilot. The, the, they carried it around just to see what is the experience of carrying this thing that's this size around way back, but nonetheless, it, uh, it had its day. And then sketching. Um, the, reason, the reason we started with sketching was to sort of open minds. Sketching is more than just um, getting an idea on paper. Sketching is a way of prototyping, interacting with, and 
experimenting with your ideas and iterating them too. I knew um, in a, a, a person I knew who's a graphic designer was designing a logo for just a, a mom and pop uh, candy company. And she had 70, 70 sketches just to produce a logo uh, for this company. And it was, it's the exploration process that's important. Uh, we'll, the, the, we'll skip the video for the sake of time. This is How Might We? And How Might We is one of my favorites because it's, it's, a, it's a chance to say, we, we have what seems to be a, an, an insurmountable problem facing us. We're going to get together and just ask the question, how might we? And it, it includes reframing the problem. It includes considering all the resources available. Thanks, guys. It, um, it's unconstrained, and it's, it's why this image uh, from Apollo 13, to me, is a, a good analogy. Because it's, uh, it, it, took, it took crazy ideas. It took building upon others' ideas in order to successfully solve a problem that appeared to have no solution. Uh, we'll skip the video itself. But, and just to kind of close off, now we're at the design stage. Now we're testing, now we're testing the designs we have. We're getting ready to take the final steps towards shipping. And the quote is, design is not just what it looks like and feels like, it's how it works. So we're getting ready to deliver. We've gotten our ideas. The, uh, the goals are to test, debug, launch. The mindset is critical, entrepreneur, critical of your design, entrepreneurial in terms of getting the, getting the minimum viable product to market, getting something out there that can be used, and strategic in that sense because now you're thinking about iterations and roadmaps. Uh, tactics are think aloud testing. This is very similar to the interviewing we discussed, but now your, your, your interviewees are using your prototype as opposed to whatever existed previously. And as they use it, they're sharing their thoughts about it verbally as they walk step by step. So this, it, it can require a bit of coaching, but um, it's, it's arguably the most important testing process. Heuristic evaluation is basically a series of, of additional tests that test to uh, against heuristics that are almost um, assumed expectations from your customers. And then iteration. And for the sake of time, um, I'll go through these pretty quickly. But, uh, and I kind of just already answered them. There are 10 kind of commonly uh, accepted heuristics for digital products. And rather than go through the 10 of them, uh, they're, they're very basic uh, and, and uh, logical. I'll show you that here is, th this is a clip from a news story. I, I, I won't play the video, but you can see the, the title to the, this news snippet is Crosswalk Confusion. And in Santa Clara, California, they installed, without warning anybody, they installed stoplight systems that had two red lights and one yellow light. And, and the, the, the laughter that I hear is exactly the way it turned out. Nobody knew what to do. Everybody was confused because they broke the convention of what is expected for users. So that's really what, in, I, to me, in a nutshell, what the heuristics are all about. Um, and I think this, this is a relevant uh, quote in that context, never give an order that can't be obeyed to your customers. And this is one that for my personal life that I like to use every chance possible. Uh, but um, sorry, we didn't have time for the activities themselves, but we did manage on the dot to get through, <laughs> to get through the content.